Before we start, let me introduce myself. I am um, Thomas Segismont. I come from Marseille, a city in the south of France. I am a Vertex Core team member since 2016, and I do open source for a living thanks to Red Hat since 2012. I came to the Vertex project because I was previously working for a monitoring system, and I uh, started to build uh, plugins for Vertex to monitor application, and then I continued contributing and, and, and joined the team eventually. So uh, what is Eclipse Vertex? It's, a Verte it's an Eclipse Foundation project. It's a toolkit to build reactive applications on the JVM. So what does toolkit mean first? Toolkit means two things here. First one is that it's just a library. You don't download the server. You don't have to download the Tomcat or Wi Flight server. It's just um, a dependency that you have to your POM file or to your uh, Gradle build file. Okay? The other thing is that it's not a framework which mandates a way of programming your application. Okay? You don't have to do bins with annotation. You program uh, as you want. And you can do that in um, existing application and just benefit from the features you're interested in or start a full system from scratch. It works just as fine. Reactive means a lot of different things, right? It's a buzzword. It covers a lot of areas. Um, for this, the matter of this presentation, it really means that we are going to program not with um, imperative style and blocking APIs, but with um, event-based, uh, event-driven event pro, uh, event, um, programming. And when we will call non-blocking APIs, we will define callbacks, which will be called when the event um, happens. Okay. Vertex is polyglot, which means you can not only write your application in Java, but also in a handful of languages: so JavaScript, Groovy, JRuby, Scala, Kotlin. But it's polyglot on the JVM. So if you do JavaScript, it will be JavaScript on Nashorn, or if you do Ruby, it will be uh, on JRuby. If I had to sum up the Vertex philosophy in a, f in a few words, I would say it's paid the right price. Okay, we're in 2018, and if we are writing an application which parses JSON uh, coming over HTTP and, and inserts data into a, a relational database, we shouldn't have to um, bring a server with multiple cores and a gigabyte memory. Right? We in the Vertex team, we are committed to help you build applications which are fast and have a tiny footprint, okay? And also, we try not to force you load in your application a lot of extension that you don't need. So it's a modular set of extension. If you only need to do some simple things, you just get the core library. And if you have um, a more complex need, then you can bring the different libraries that we have in the Vertex stack. So why is Reactive so hot? And why are we all talking about Reactive now? I'm sure you have heard about uh, Reactive programming, about Reactive streams, about Reactive systems. Spring now is doing Spring Reactive. And even in the G GDK team, they are building now um, Reactive drivers for databases and Reactive HTTP clients. So, so why is everyone talking about Reactive? Um, the reason is that for modern application, the reactive model is very powerful. And to help you understand that, I will talk about a, a hotel room startup story, which is partially made up. I, I, I worked for a similar company, but there are many, many uh, items in this presentation which are just completely made up. But it will help to understand. So this uh, startup um, was founded uh, during the internet boom. And at that time, nobody um, could sell hotel rooms on the internet. So the founder got the idea to help them bring their data about the rooms and the uh, availabilities in a database, and then create a web page for the hotel. Simple start, a relational database, a web server, and that's it. Then you want to make this startup uh, more successful, so you have to build partnerships. And the way to do that is to work with the people who sell um, hotel software. So in the um, actual building, they have computers with a planning management system where they schedule when a room will be cleaned, etc. And if you think about it, every, every, all the data you need to do your online system is already there. So 
the, your clients, they don't want to type everything twice, so they ask you to work with this software, and now you have to synchronize the data. Then, as you build your partnerships, you're more successful, so you have more users. So to help your server going fast, you add a cache. You cache the database from the rows, and you probably also cache uh, the entire web page of the hotel, because if you build it for one customer, it's going to be the same for the next one. Time goes by, you still ride, you still have uh, new partnerships to do because now you have uh, actors on the, mar on the market who actually sell hotels uh, for all around the world, like Booking.com, just an example, but there are many of us. And your customers, they want to be, uh, to be um, um, available on those platforms, but they don't want to you know, make contracts with all of them. So they charge you of, uh, to synchronize, they ask you to synchronize your data with those platforms and to manage the bookings for, uh, for, for them. Later on, a new type of clients, mobile phones. That is more on the client side, uh, but the difference here from the uh, usual browsers uh, in uh, internet at home is that the, um, the network connection is completely different. At home, you have DSL, you have DSL links, it works fast, it works uh, reliably. And if you're on a phone, well, if you go in a tunnel or if you are in a building with thick walls, it's not going to work very well. Your site is still growing, so later on you have to stop, you know, store everything in a relational database, especially the comments about your room, etc. So you heard about NoSQL and you add a new data store to your system. So if you look at this and you compare it to the system from the beginning, then you might think that there's a bit, it's a big departure from the, from the original architecture. So the two differences is now we have many, many channels uh, of communications, and we do a lot of IOs compared to the beginning. And this is not going to work very well with traditional imperative blocking um, uh, programming. So why? Let's take an example of a simple networking program which just reads data which comes in on the network, reads a line, and then Right by, uh, if, if the echo keyword is uh, at the beginning of the line, it will write it back uh, on the network. So the two red blocks that you see here actually represent that the fact that the, your thread will be blocked while calling the method bufferedreader.readline. It will block there because if you have a slow client, um, the method cannot return until you have all the data to represent a line. Okay, and later on when you call bufferwriter.write, it will also block because as your client cannot receive the data as fast as you produce it, you have to wait before your system buffers have uh, some empty space before you can write the line. So, this may be acceptable if you only have a few dozen clients, but if you have lots of them, then you are going to waste your, the resources of your system. Okay, why? Because you're, you're, there is a cost for your system to um, uh, do context switching between all those threads. Okay, and even when your thread is rescheduled, then you, are not, you have no guarantee that the, the CPU cache will still have your thread data. Okay, so maybe it's gone and you have to go back to main memory, which it is not so, so bad in terms of performance but it's really worse compared to having all the data right in the CPU cache, okay? So you see this and you say, okay, thousands of connections, but I don't do that. I'm not Google, I'm not Netflix, okay? I do enterprise software. That's not my problem. And you're right in a way, because if you think about commodity hardware today, it's if you're working in a large corporation, Buying a big server with many cores and lots of memory, it's not so difficult, okay? But um, who here is talking about doing microservices architecture or already doing ar microservices architecture? Yeah, I would say majority in the room. So when you do that, you do that because you want uh, small teams, you want to deploy often, and, and you have many services, and they are comparable to our modern application we were talking about, because those services, they are combined, there are a lot of inputs, there are a lot of outputs, 
And when you deploy with these uh, services, you, have, you, you need a platform to orchestrate, right? So you're probably going to use something like Kubernetes and package your application in containers. But guess what? In your container, you don't get the big machine that we just talked about. You just got a very little fraction of it, right? Two virtual CPUs and a few hundred megabytes, and that's all. So if you want to make the most of the hardware that is available to us now, if we are doing internet-style uh, business, or tomorrow when we are going to do microservices um, in, in much more than we are doing today, we need to keep the threads in our um, system to a minimum, and we need to keep them busy, OK? And to keep them busy, we can use um, uh, event loop systems where you have a single thread which will pick up uh, tasks in a queue and handle the, the event one af events one after the other, OK? So that's not anything new. If you've been doing uh, browser development, uh, you, you know event loops. If you have done Node.js, it's exactly the same. Um, but in Java, it's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not so common, at, at least if you're not doing um, uh, UE, um, UE uh, development. So how do have Vertex uh, work with event loops? In Vertex, we uh, acknowledge the fact that we don't only have one CPU core in general. At least we have two small virtual CPUs. So we don't only create one, one event loop, but we create two event loops per core, OK? And we will need a way to, to you know, use all, this, uh, all, all these event loops. And here's, here's how we do it. It's not mandatory uh, uh, with Vertex to do that, but we uh, advise to design your application in small services, which we call verticals. So what is a vertical? It's just a class which extends abstract vertical and a start method, which is the entry point of the application. And once you deploy that with your Vertex uh, instance, then Vertex will assign a single event loop to that uh, vertical, OK? So that's pretty simple, because you know you will never have many threads invoking this code. So you get rid of synchronization, you get rid of uh, concurrent data structures, etc. You just do plain single threaded code. And then if you want to scale to all the cores, you deploy multiple instances. You just sell that in deployment option. Now if you think about it, if you try to create three times the same HTTP server with traditional uh, Java software, you will probably get an exception. Okay, the, the port is already used. With Vertex, it's a bit different. When you do that, the system recognizes that you are trying to uh, deploy multiple instances of the same application, and it will load balance the connections uh, across the vertical. And this is how you make the most of your hardware, okay? How do we communicate between verticals? We have something that we call the event bus. And to avoid having to manage um, um, shared data structure, the event bus helps you to favor message, message passing style. Um, there are different styles uh, which are supported. There is request to reply, uh, fire and forget, and uh, uh, publish subscribe. What's cool with the event bus is that it can work standalone or distributed. So you can make it span different JVMs on the local area uh, na network, OK? How does that work? Well, you simply grab a Vertex event bus object and you register a consumer uh, on an address, which is an ab arbitrary string, OK? It's not something complex like uh, hierarchical, uh, hierarchical uh, uh, addresses. When you get the message, you take the body. And here we are designing a, a greeter. So we take the, we take the, the greeting um, name and we just say hello to that name. On the other side, in the other vertical, again, we take the event bus object and we just invoke the send method. Okay, so we send to the same address, greeting. Here we are going to send the message QCon SP. And when, this, uh, when we'll get the reply, then we'll simply look if uh, it, uh, it was successful or not. And if it is, we uh, um, print the greeting to the console or we uh, print the error. OK? A good, and when user, new users discover that feature, usually that's what make, you know, 
the byte in the, in the, in the toolkit, um, we have what we call bridges for the event bus. That means that on the JVM, you can install something which will bring the event bus to um, a browser over WebSocket or to a mobile phone over TCP, okay? I just talk about those two ones because it's the major usage, but with the TCP bridge, you could also um, make legacy applications interact with your new Vertex system. So that's a lot of talk, and maybe you want to see uh, that in action a, a little bit, so let's see how that works. So, I have prepared two directories, one HTTP where we will create an HTTP server vertical, and which will be deployed in a single JVM, and in another directory we will create a, a greater vertical and we are going to make them communicate over the network. And what I want to show you here is that it's very simple to do. It's just a few, a few steps, and you have a di distributed system. And also, you'll be able to see that it's not very complex to design a simple, uh, simple application uh, with uh, Vertex, okay? So we'll start by uh, generating Uh, a new project with the, the uh, Vertex Maven plugin. So it's not mandatory to use it, but it's very convenient. And it, it's, this Maven plugin has a goal to set up a project. So in this uh, directory, we are going to set up the uh, HTTP vertical. And you can notice that I added a name for my vertical class and two dependencies. First, the web module, which will help us build like some sort of REST API on top of a Vertex Core HTTP server, and also the InfiniSpan uh, module. So this module, it's actually a cluster manager, and this is what will allow us to connect the two JVMs, okay? So let's do that. I should now have a POM and a source file. So I can open that in IntelliJ. All right. So if I open the vertical class, is it big enough for everyone? OK, perfect. So you see, I have my uh, HTTP server vertical, which extends abstract vertical. I'm just going to take the vertex object and create an HTTP server. At this point, nothing happens yet, okay? I have to tell it what to do when a request comes in. So a request coming in is an event, so I have to give it a callback. So when a request comes in, I will have to do something. And eventually, we need to tell it to listen on a port, okay? But that's not very useful yet. The Vertex web module helps you to define REST APIs. To do that, you must create a router object, router dot router and you give it the vertex instance. And then you are going to define routes uh, with the, the type of request you want to handle. For example, I would like to handle a get request on the greeting path, okay? And here I have to tell it what to do when a new request will come in. So I define a handler for the event. when I will send an HTTP request, this handler will be invoked, and it gives me a routing context. The routing context gives me access to the response object so I can talk with the client, etc., or inspect the, the HTTP server request. But what we want to do here is what we saw just before. We want to get the event bus object, and send a message to the greeting address, 
we are going we want it to say hello qcon um, qcon sp okay and when this is done we want to be notified when we get the reply so we need a handler for the asynchronous result and if this result is a success we are going to reply to the client with the content of the message so the message we get it by calling result body okay I have to tell it that it's a string message otherwise it won't be happy and in case of failure then the routing context object has a fail method which is very handy and you can just give it the the throwable and it will just fail the request and log the message okay now how do, how do, do I link those two elements I have my HTTP server here here and I have my router defined here how do I connect that I just say in the request handler but I want the router accept method to be called when a new request comes in and then the router will parse the request analyze the path and determine that my handler needs to be called okay so far so good this is the HTTP server part but we need the, the backend we need the greater service so let's do that this time I will create a vertical greeter and I don't need I only need the, the InfiniSpan module because I still want clustering but I don't need web because I will just um, register a consumer on the event bus and nothing else okay so the plug the Maven plugin will generate a vertical for me now my project is ready I can go to the greeter I get the event bus object register a consumer on the greeting address and tell it that whenever a message comes in I need to reply to it okay so I will just invoke reply and what is the content of my reply it's just a message a greeting and the parameter is the message body okay and that's it we're done so now we need to start those two applications so what I will do first is to build it what the, the vertex maven plugin does here is that it will build a, a fat jar of the application so now I only have to I only have to specify the, the path of the jar okay in target HTTP uh, uh, dot jar and notice this dash cluster parameter which tells it to start vertex in cluster mode okay so now InfiniSpan starts and and um, uh, tries to find if there, if there are other nodes but doesn't find any and just deploy the vertical we'll do the same on the other side now my greeter Fajar is ready and I can do the same and if everything goes well it should find two nodes I hope it did yes you can see two nodes were detected and if I open a new tab well I didn't do the parameter so we can only we can just uh, call uh, greeting 
we should get our LO QCanus P. So here what happened is that the server, the HTTP server vertical parsed the request with Vertex Web and then sent the message on the event bus. It didn't know if there was, if there was another vertical listening on the event bus, but there was here clustered on another JVM, got the message, got a reply, and printed the, printed the greeter, okay? Any questions so far? That's fine? Okay. So now let's uh, skip to the second part of the presentation, which is about reactive programming with RxJava and how you can do it with uh, Eclipse Vertex. Uh, reactive programming is actually a way to represent everything as a stream of data or events. Okay, so it could be a stream of uh, mouse clicks, it could be a stream of rows coming up from a database, anything, anything, and, is, and it's uh, represented as a stream. The API is basically like the Java 8 stream API, but uh, with much more operators, so you, you can, of course, do uh, filtering with a predicate, and my mapping with a transfer, uh, transformer function, etc. But it has a lot of uh, it has a lot more uh, operators like um, uh, advanced grouping, buffering, uh, debouncing, etc. So that's that's very useful. Like the Java 8 streams API, it is lazy, so nothing happens until the observer subscribes to the observable. Okay, but on the contrary, it's not uh, pull based; it's push based. So. If the observable does not emit any item, the uh, 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 observer will not block the program and you will just be notified when you get a, a new item uh, pushed to the observer. RxJava supports black pressure. What, what, why is it needed? So let's imagine that you are implementing an application which loads rows from a database and send it to a mobile phone or something like that and you have a slow connection with the mobile phone. If you do it with imperative programming and uh, blocking APIs, when you will have loaded the first batch of rows and the buffers are, are uh, full, then the thread will be blocked until some space is, uh, um, is the done in the, in the, um, and you can set another batch of rows, okay? So there is no way for your application to load everything in memory because it will be blocked before it can send all the data to the client. If you do that with non-blocking APIs and an event loop system, your, your application will explode. Why? Because you can queue as many events as you want, load all the data from the database, and then send it, and, and then queue, queue the event to send to the client. And you need a mechanism to tell, to tell the observable please don't send me more events than I am able to handle. And this is what the request uh, method from the observer will allow. The uh, API comes in different flavors. Um, the basic one that everyone knows is uh, observable, but sometimes you have operations we just, which just, just don't return anything. So for example, if you're deleting a file on the file system, there is no result. You just want to know if it failed or if it succeeded. If you want to get the metadata about a file, then you will have a single because you will get just one object with the properties like creation time, etc. There's a little note about RxJava 2. Um, there's a difference between the two versions of the libraries. RxJava 2 is Reactive Streams compliant, so it does not support null elements in the streams. So they introduced this new maybe because sometimes the observables that you create, they, you just can cope. You you have to you have to uh, to have null in it. So they introduced maybe to deal with it, and also. They introduced Flowable, which is the, the observable supporting uh, back pressure in RxJava 2, and observable in RxJava 2 doesn't support it. The reason is that you have, you have two types of sources of events. If you, for example, think about database rows coming from the database, it's easy to say stop sending new database rows, okay? But if you are representing with your observables clicks from a user, then there is no way you can tell the user to stop clicking. Well, you can show a message, but <laughs> that won't stop him or her to, to click the mouse. 
Rx Java is very useful because maybe you've heard in the past about the callback L. When you do um, um, call event loop programming with callbacks, it's difficult to compose uh, uh, to compose concurrent uh, operations. So Rx Java with with all these operator does that very well. So here. Imagine that you have a, an, an observable of you, you are managing a, um, a, a service which um, which is a, a block block um, block system, and you have in your database in your relational database all the IDs of the post, and you want to get all the comments from uh, from the post of a certain date. So you will be able to use, uh, for example, the concat map operation, which will take your post ID and return a new observable of the comments for this post, okay? And this operator will give you a new observable, a new stream of all the comments, okay? That's very powerful. It's also very powerful to deal with failures in latency because our modern application are a distributed system. So the network is not always uh, available. Sometimes it's so, sometimes uh, the, the, simply the switch the, just died, so you, you don't have a connection anymore. And RxJava has many operators to deal with that. One of them is retry, which will just resubscribe to the source if something bad happened. But you also have timeout, which tells you, if I don't get my result in time, then send me an error. And in case you want to fail gracefully, you have another operator uh, on error return, which will just say, if I can get the result, just give me a fallback and, and it's, um, it will be fine. What I want you to, to, to get from this, uh, from, from this um, slide is that you can compose all of these operators easily, and then you have a very compact and readable, um, readable program which tells you in a few lines what you are doing. Try to do the same with imperative programming and it will be a lot more complex. One thing with um, uh, RxJava, it's just a library you, uh, like Vertex, you bring it into your, your program, your new program or, or um, your existing one. And often you have to create your own observables from your existing code, okay? With Vertex, we, we do a lot of that for you. So if you take any module from Vertex, we, we saw the router earlier in the demo, uh, we have Rxified APIs, okay? So in this example, it's the Rx Java 2 Rxified API. So we had a router in the Vertex web um, module, and we also have the Rxified version. You just need to change the import and add the reactive X uh, prefix, okay? So that's two different interfaces. How do they differ? Let's take the example of uh, the HTTP uh, server from Vertex. You have the listen method, which lets you um, bind the HTTP server to a certain port. In the core Vertex library, you need to pass a port and a handler as well, which will be executed when the operation succeeds or fails. With your rectified version, it's a bit different. Uh, you see you don't pass the, the handler anymore. The method is, is prefixed with Rx, and instead of returning nothing, it returns a single, okay? So now you have singles, you have observables, you can start composing your application with the Vertex APIs. What's important to, no to note is that in the first version, the um, HTTP server will try to bind as soon as you invoke the listen method. Whereas in the second one, like in many, uh, like in any Rx Java application, it will only happen when you subscribe to that single, okay? We haven't talked about it before, but in Vertex you also have uh, streams, read stream to be precise. It's, uh, it's, it's really like an observable, but it's much lighter in terms of um, uh, API that it offers. A read stream in Vertex, you can only pause it and resume. Okay, so it manages back, back pressure, but it doesn't manage um, um, transformation, coordination, like we saw with RxJava. 
But with the rectified read stream, you can invoke the two observable or two flowable, depending on the type of read stream you are dealing with. And, uh, and then you are back on the Rx server world, OK? I have built a small demo um, to show you how to build a, a full application with, uh, with um, uh, Vertex and Rx Java. It's available on GitHub. You can fork it and, and experiment with it. We are going to just see it a bit in, in a moment. What does it do? It, it's um, a music application. Uh, basically, I took my music library from my computer and parsed the, the XML file where all the, all the uh, tracks were, were recorded. And then I put all the data in a relational database in Postgres. Um, and then I built a website where you can uh, comment on the albums. Okay? And to show the, the, the covers, uh, we will uh, send HTTP requests to the cover art archive. Okay, so it's, it's difficult to, to show all the codes, but we are going to do a bit of Rx Java and Vertex to, to show you how it looks. Okay. So we need to stop those first. Okay. Let's go to... the application directory. And let's see what happens in the code. So once you have cloned the project, you will see that there is a lot of handlers for the different kinds of requests. We have handlers for uh, loading, a, preparing an album page. We have handlers for um, uh, retrieving the cover, uh, etc. We have handlers to uh, handle the, the, the page where we show uh, all, all albums and all artists of the same genre. Um, so it's pretty large. You, you, you can, you can try, uh, try the code. I have prepared three, three small tags that, that we have to do to make it work. So the first thing is that in the main vertical where we define everything, the, the different routes uh, to, for the application and where we bind all the uh, request handlers, uh, at the end, I need to return a completable to indicate to my application when the HTTP server is ready, okay? So now to make it compile, I just, um, created a, a completable which is already completed, but it does nothing. So this time we are going to use the Erixified vertex. We still, like we did before in the other demo, invoke the create HTTP server method. We still need to tell it to delegate request events to the, to the router. But now we don't want to do callbacks, because if I do callbacks, then how do I return my completable? I will have to you know, write it by hand. So instead of listen, I will invoke rx listen and pass a port. OK? But rx listen. returns a single, remember? We saw that in the slide before. It returns a single with the HTTP server as the only event when the HTTP server is ready. So we will use another operator from Rx Java, which just says ignore the element, and that returns a completable, okay? So this is done. Well, at least I hope it is. So let's start the application. We need a Postgres database. I do this with Docker for the, for the demo, but there is also Docker Compose scripts if you want just to try the application without modifying it. So it's easy to, to do it at home if you want. Now I need to start my Mongo server. Okay. And finally, I can start my application. So this time you see I don't 
build the fat jar, I just invoke uh, uh, the Vertex um, Maven plugin run goal. And what's cool with it is that it will detect changes in the application. So if you want to do fast turnarounds while you are developing, you can just change the code and it will reload the application for you, okay? So my application is ready. Let's see if I can get to it. Cool, so I have the, um, the music store page. I have all the jars this, uh, which are available in the database. So let's see if I can find one album in particular. Okay, so here it could go and load everything from the, from the album and load the, the, the cover and the tracks. And we have the, the, the small part for, the, for writing comments. That's fine. Okay. So I'm going to skip one of the on the elements because um, otherwise we won't have, have time for questions. I'm just going to skip to the part where we insert comments for an album and see how we send them to the browser. Okay. I will create two browsers on on my uh, start two browsers on my laptop enter comments on one, which will be sent to the server, and when it will be inserted in Mongo, we will emit an event on the event bus, and thanks to the bridge, it will go back to browsers, and we will see a notification about the uh, new data being persisted, okay? So in this hand album command handler, we have uh, all the code to uh, persist in Mongo, but at the end, when we reply to, to the uh, HTTP request, we are missing the, the step where we sending to the event bus. So for this, I will simply do do on complete and just invoke a simple action, which is grabbing the event bus object and publishing on a specific address here, which all my browsers listen, and will send the content, which is just a, a JSON view of my comment in, uh, in Mongo, okay? So that's it. With the, this uh, do and complete, I'm pretty sure that after the comments has, has been inserted in Mongo, this callback will be, will be invoked and the message will be pushed to the browsers, okay? So let's see that in action. When I recompile the Vertex Maven plugin should reload the application. Okay, it worked. Now let's open another browser and have a look at the same album. I can add comments, but I need to be, no, I can't, thank you. Okay, what's wrong here? Mm. No logs. Mm -hmm. Let's try in the other one. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I just have to skip that part. I'm sorry. You can just try it at home. Sorry for that. Um, so, just going back to the presentation, if you want to learn more about writing programs with Vertex and RxJava, we wrote a guide for Java programmers. If you have a background with um, a Spring or or Java E, then you can read this guide. It, it, it's a guide to build web applications like the one we just did. And also, if you're more in microservices, there, uh, my uh, teammate Clément wrote um, a mini book about building microservices with, uh, with uh, Vertex. Um, and that's all I have. Um, 
you, we can now have some time for a few questions. And if we don't manage to get to, all, to, to reply all of them, I will be at the Red Hat booth uh, this afternoon, and you can meet me there. Any questions? Uh, yes, I think someone will bring you a microphone. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Uh, anything related to order preservation of the requests? Why can, can you speak louder, please? Anything related to order preservation of the events while you are doing this uh, reactive programming with the toolkit? So, for instance, for the mouse click events that you mentioned. If I want all or every mouse click of the same um, UI going to be processed in a given order, can I assign it to a particular uh, thread or something like that? Can you do that? Or you can't get uh, into order? I don't, I don't think it's really related to the, the event loop that will end all the events for your uh, program. Um, it's just that how, the way you build your syllable. So if you, if you make sure that uh, events are published in order, then when you will uh, create your observer and transform, this order will be preserved. There is no way for uh, data to be reshuffled around unless you write operators to do that. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, does that answer your question? Or maybe we can continue on that after. OK. Any other question? Okay, thank you.